I'm so glad that you guys are here this morning. I'm glad to see all of the fathers in the house. Um, fathers, from one father to another, happy Father's Day to you guys. Um, yeah. You know, I know, you know, I know for Mother's Day, they start doing, putting commercials on TV a month in advance. For Father's Day, I still haven't seen a commercial yet. And it's Father's Day today, and I still haven't seen a commercial. I still haven't seen a commercial about Father's Day. Um, but I want to honor you guys because the reality is, if it's not for you, we don't have a home. God created the institution of family, and that family consists of a father and a mother and their children. And so thank you guys for everything that you do um, because you are more than just a provider. You are more than just a protector. Um, you are the leader of your home and your family goes as you go. So thank you for everything that you do for your family um, because without you, um, I don't know where we'd be. We'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, today I want to honor um, my father. I don't know if they found, the, if they got the picture yet. This is, you know, my biological father was not in my life. And I came to Mighty Wind Worship Center at the age of 17. And I was introduced to a man that um, was willing to take me on as his son and to be the father that I never had and always wanted. And he poured into me and sacrificed every, everything that was his, he willingly gave it to me. Um, he opened his heart and he opened his family and he opened his door. He opened that and allowed me inside and I am only the man I am today because of what he modeled for me and who he taught me to become. And so um, once the father of this ministry um, and always my father, who I will always remember and always honor, um, I want to honor Joe Carbajal um, because without him, um, there would be no me. Um, without him, there would be no Mighty Wind Worship Center. And without him, there would not be a lot of you guys in here today. And so I honor him today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thank you guys. Thank you for being patient and honoring him with me. Um, he, was a, he was a man's man. He's not going to, he wasn't the guy to fix anything for you, okay? He wasn't the guy, he was, his fixing was duct tape, okay? So you didn't want him to fix anything for you. but he was the embodiment of what God created men to be. Men to be honorable, to be a man of your word, to do what you say you're gonna do, to make hard decisions, to be a leader when it was time to be a leader, 
um, and to speak truth to you even if it hurts your feelings. He wasn't concerned about your feelings. <laughs> he was concerned about you fulfilling the potential that God had in you. And so I, if you know him today, then you know why I honor him. If you don't know him today, then hopefully you got a little insight on who he was by this time this morning. But thank you so much um, for allowing me to do that. And um, I will always honor the man who was dad to me, pastor to me, and my best friend. Um, and I called him Pop. And uh, he was everything to me. And so I want to honor him today. And thank you guys for giving me that opportunity to do so. Thank you, family, for allowing me to do that. Um, I know it was a surprise, and I know that wasn't easy to, to see. But he deserves to be honored. And so um, thank you guys for allowing me to do that. And that took everything in me not to stand up here and boo-hoo. Um, and I can hear him. Boy, suck it up. Quit crying. This ain't no time for you to be crying. You got ministry to do. So this morning, the title to the message is simply this. You will never change what you tolerate. You will never change what you tolerate. Yes, this is a message for men, but this is a message for everybody. I don't care who you are. You'll never change what you tolerate. If you tolerate somebody disrespecting you, then that's what you will continue to get, is somebody disrespecting you. If you tolerate your children being rebellious, then guess what? They're going to always be rebellious. If you tolerate being broke, then you will always be broke. If you tolerate gossiping, you will always be acknowledged as a gossiper. As long as you tolerate it, nothing will ever change. We have a decision to make today. You know, because we always, every time people come into my office, every time in worship, every time in service, every time something goes wrong in your life, the first thing that we always say is, is I want to change. But the question is, do you really want to change? Because if you really want to change, then you won't tolerate your own behavior. Oh, y'all quiet today. If you really want to change, you won't tolerate the behavior that prevents you from changing. If you really want to change, you won't tolerate the behavior that prevents you from changing. Today, you and I have to be honest with ourselves, because you can pray all you want to, but if you still tolerate sin, change is not coming. You can pray all you want to, but if you're not willing to do something different, change is not coming. Experiencing God says this, you and I are required to make adjustments in our life to join God in what he's doing. See, we want God to join us in what we're doing. See, but that says there are major adjustments required in your life for you and I to join what God is doing. 
God is doing something. God wants to do something in your life. God is trying to do something in your life. But if you continue to tolerate mediocrity, if you continue to tolerate sin, if you continue to tolerate what's beneath you, then change will not come. You can pray, you can shout, you can scream, you can say hallelujah, you can run around the church, you can do whatever it is you want to do. You can have all the pomp and circumstance you want to, but until you're willing to not tolerate the very behavior that's preventing you from changing, nothing will change in your life. Pop used to tell me this. He used to say this to me. He said, mijo, your desire to change must be greater than your desire to stay the same. Your desire to change must be greater than your desire to stay the same. You have to want it. Regardless of the pain, regardless of what it costs you, you have to have a desire that's greater than you settling for where you are right now. Because obviously where you are right now is not where you want to be because you won't change. It's easy for us to fall back into what we know, even if it's dysfunctional, because it's easy. We are the laziest people on the face of the earth. Christians are lazy. I said it. I said it. We want to be spoon fed. We want God to do it for us. We want the Holy Spirit to show up. Here you go. We want God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to, to perform miracles and to do great things and to entrust us with the intricacies and the mysteries of the gospel. And we want him to empower us to do great things, but we don't want to change. God is not going to miraculously show up on your doorstep and give you anything. Everything in life costs you something. Somebody say everything in life costs you something. If you want a Mercedes, guess what? You got to pay for a Mercedes. It's a lot of us in the spirit realm that has Mercedes taste. but we got a cutlass budget. They don't even make cutlasses anymore. That's the reality. But I'm telling you that God is saying to you today, enough is enough. God is in the mold to where he is no longer babying you and I. God is in the mode to where he's saying, I've equipped you, I've done what I can do. Now you gotta do something. See, because the Bible says, according to his divine nature, we have been given everything, we have been given everything that we need for life and godliness. We've been given everything we need. It's already in you. Now you just got to apply it and do something with it. Your desire to change must be greater than your desire to stay the same. So I'm going to give you three things today. We're going to start in Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. 
And this is the story of the Israelites. They've come out of Egypt. They're out of Egypt and they're on their journey. And God has given his word that they will have manna every day. He's going to provide for them manna every day. But the issue is what the Israelites were accustomed to were vegetables, leeks, onions, the good stuff. And all it cost them was slavery. Oh, see that? Y'all missed that all along. God is trying to change their mindset. He's trying to change their mindset and he's removing things from their life so that their total dependence is on him. And he's saying to them this, your desire to change, which is what you prayed for for 400 years, that I deliver you and create change in your life, your desire to change has to be greater than your desire to stay the same. I know you had onions over there. I know you had leeks over there. I know you had some tomatoes over there. I know you had some good things over there. But what it cost you was is that you were in slavery and you didn't have a say-so. You were in bondage. You needed to be delivered. So you might have enjoyed the fruits, but the cost was too high. Now he's saying to you, I'm willing to deliver you. Matter of fact, I have delivered you. And I want to give you something else, but your desire to change has to be greater than your desire to stay the same. See, many of us are caught in the middle right now. We're not where we were, but we're not where we're supposed to be yet. We're right in the middle. And sometimes being in the middle is the hardest place to be. But verse 4 says this, Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites begin to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also begin to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. It says, then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites. In another version, it says the riffraff. The riffraff that was traveling, it wasn't even Israelites. It was somebody that came along in the journey and connected themselves to them and wanted to be a part of what they were doing. Didn't pay the price, but wanted to be a part of what they were doing. In another version, it calls them riffraff. In another one, it calls them troublemakers. He said the foreign rabble. If you're going to have change come in your life, if your desire to change is going to be greater than your desire to stay the same, you need to be aware of who you're traveling with. This is not, whoa, revelation you've never heard before, but this is something that you need to be able to apply to your life. You need to know who you're traveling with. I need to know who I'm traveling with. I need to know who you are. I need to know where you came from. I need to know what you're going to say. I need to know if you got my best interests at hand or if you're just using me to get what you want. It was foreign rabble. They hadn't even paid the price the Israelites had, but they wanted to be part of the deliverance. Some of you are running around asking everybody under the sun how to help you. 
Some of you have surrounded yourself with yes men. Some of you have surrounded yourself with people that are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. Some of us have surrounded ourselves with people that don't even serve God. Some of us have surrounded ourselves with people that don't know truth. Some of us have surrounded ourselves with people that, did, that failed at the same thing that we're failing at, and then we have the audacity to ask them for advice. And then we take what they say and apply it and wonder why it doesn't work and then blame God in the process when you never even ask God, you ask the people you were traveling with. You better know who you're traveling with. You better know who's in your circle. You better know who's supporting you. You better know who has your back. See, because when adversity comes, I need to know that you got my back and I've got yours. See, I need to know that when we get in adversity, you're not going to start talking about me. And you're not going to stab me in my back. And you're not going to, I can't trust you. For your desire to change, uh, uh, to, to change to be greater than your desire to stay the same, you got to know who you're traveling with. If you're traveling with riffraff, it's time to change who you're traveling with. If you're traveling with troublemakers, it's time to change who you're traveling with. You've got a church full of people. You've got a community that's willing to travel with you. I don't stand up here and talk about classes and small groups for the heck of it. I do it because the foundation of our relationship with God is, a, is about relationships. The foundation of the gospel message is relationships. God loved us enough to know that we were in sin and we were out of right relationship with him. So he gave his son to die on the cross, resurrect him in three days so that we could believe in him and we could be reconciled into a right relationship with God. It's about relationships. The gospel message is about relationships. When I travel, I need to have somebody that I can travel with. I need to have somebody in my life that's going to hold me accountable. I need to have somebody in my life that's going to tell me when I'm wrong. I need to have somebody in my life that's going to tell me I didn't address that right. I didn't handle that right. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have said that. I need somebody in my life that's willing to hold me accountable. I don't need a yes man. I need, I need iron so, so iron can be sharpened. We live in a society that believes in plastic relationships. Nobody wants to say anything to anybody. Well, don't come around me because you ain't going to like me because I'm going to tell you what's wrong. You don't want to be around me. Because my goal, my responsibility that God has given me is for you to become everything that he's created you to be. And I can't do that being a yes man to you. I got to tell you when you're wrong. I got to speak truth to you. Don't get mad at me if we're at a public event and I see you drinking and you're a leader in this church and Pastor Golden taps you on your shoulder and said, I, you don't need to be doing that. You are setting an example for somebody. You are a representation of Jesus. You are a representation of me. You are a representation of Mighty One Worship Center. You are a leader in the ministry. You gonna lead worship tomorrow? I ain't picking on worship team. I don't know if that's, I'm just using them as an example. I don't want nobody saying, why are you picking on the worship team? I'm just, I don't want, Lexus was already side-eyeing me. I don't want her to do that. She was already trying to side-eye me. See, we need people in our life that are willing to say that to us. If you get offended, so be it. I'd rather offend you than God. It, I'd rather go to sleep at night at peace 
than him being upset because I didn't fulfill my responsibility. The blood's not going to be on my hands. It's going to be on yours. See, you've got a decision to make. Do you really want to change? Some of us are so comfortable in life, we're happy where we are. I don't need to change, I'm good. This is more than what I ever expected in my life. So I'm good, I don't need to change. I'm fine right where I am. No, you're not. You're settling for less. Because God has more. The question is, do you want it? Do you want more? Or are you too lazy to pay the price? If that offended you, I'm sorry. Take that up with the Lord. <laughs> then it says this, and the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. Stop complaining. If you want your desire for change to be greater than your desire to stay the same, you got to stop complaining. Complaining never resolved anything. Complaining is the most destructive thing around and will destroy anything God is doing in your life. It destroys peace, it destroys joy, it destroys anything that God is trying to do. Have you ever been around somebody that complains all the time? Lord, it'll suck the life out of you. Sometimes you just want to say, shut up! <laughs> Is there anything positive in you? God has been too good for you, for you to be that negative and to complain that much. Your desire to change has to be greater than your desire to stay the same, but the only way that happens is if you stop complaining. You got to stop complaining. Will you give God the opportunity to work on your behalf? Every time you complain, you shut the door to God working on your behalf. Every time you open your mouth and complain and become negative about the situation, negative about the circumstance, you shut the door and you prevent God from working. He can't work with you complaining. Verse 5 says this. So, so far, we've learned that if my desire to change is going to be greater than my desire to stay the same, one, I got to know who I'm traveling with. Two, I got to stop complaining. We're all on the same page. Verse 5 says this. We remember. Oh, we remember. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. What? And we had all the cucumbers, all the melons, all the leeks, all the onions, and all the garlic that we wanted. Our desire to change will never grow if we live in the past. You will always be satisfied for where you are if you keep looking in the past. Whether the past, well, I'm talking about good and bad in your past. Because sometimes remembering the good in your past keeps you stagnant and prevents you from moving forward. Girl, that happened in 1985. We in 2024. Oh, Pastor, that was a time when I came to the altar and I, I was and filled with the Holy Ghost and I was speaking in tongues and I was laying hands on people. What you doing now? What are you doing now? That was in 1985. We're in 2024. You mean to tell me God ain't moved? God ain't moved in that long? Yes, he has. He's done something. Where are you at? 
you got comfortable and your desire to stay the same was greater than your desire to change. We've got to always be evolving. The Bible says God takes us from glory to glory to glory. That means we're not in the same place that we were. We are constantly evolving and he's constantly making us into what he's called us to be, but we gotta be willing to change. And you can't do that living in the past. Paul said this, he said, forgetting what is behind me. He said, forgetting what is behind me, I look, I press toward the mark. Forgetting what is behind me. That's the first thing he had to do. He had to forget what was behind him. Your past is your past. It can be a reference point, but you can't live there. It cannot be your dwelling place. The only thing your past is effective for is to be a reference point, not a dwelling place. We have made it our dwelling place. When we need advice, most of us go to our past. That manner was for yesterday. You're in a new day. You're in a new time. You're in a new season. And yesterday's manner is not going to work in this season. That's what God was trying to tell the Israelites. Yeah, I know you had all those vegetables over there. That was for that season when you were in slavery. Now you're not in slavery. I've got something new for you. I've got a new provision for you. And it's not what you're accustomed to. It's not even the same thing you had before, but it's new and it's for this season. Because God deals with us in seasons. The past was the past. Some of us in here today Some of us are letting our past control decisions we make today. Some of you are married here today. And you still got unforgiveness against your previous person. The person you were with, you still have unforgiveness in your heart towards that person and you married to somebody else. And the sad part about it is your husband is paying the price for you having unforgiveness against that person. There's two men in your life, not one. And you're wondering why things aren't working like they need to now. God gave you a new husband. Speak life into that new husband and forgive that past, and stop letting, he ain't even in your life and is controlling your decisions with your husband today. She not even in your life and she's controlling your decisions with your wife today. Stop letting your past control your present. We will never change if our past is controlling our present. We will always stay the same. Shoot, there's women in here that won't even allow their husbands to be head of household because you're so used to covering for the person you used to be with, you think that's going to happen in this one. And you won't even allow, you have, you have put yourself in the place of head of household when God didn't call you to be head of household and your house is out of order and now you're wondering why your life is in chaos. It's because your life is out of order. And it all starts, all you got to do is forgive this person over here. Forgive him. Pastor, it's a process. I said the same thing. It's a process. No, it's not a process. You just don't want to do it. I didn't forgive because I was trying to make that person pay. That's the same thing you're doing. Every time you see them, every time you call, every time they check, every time you run into them, every time you even think about them, you get an attitude and they change your countenance. 
You are a slave to that person. You are a slave to your past. When are you going to get tired of being a slave? When are we going to get tired of being a slave? <laughs> God is saying, do you want to change? You got to forget the past. And you got to forgive. When I read the Bible, nowhere when he's talking about forgiveness <laughs> does Jesus ever say it's a process. I have never seen that one time in scripture where Jesus said, okay, when you forgive, ah, it's going to be a process when you forgive. No, nope. last time I read it, he said, forgive 70 times 7. He said, forgive others as I have forgiven you. Because if you don't, then I can't forgive you. I don't see him saying nothing about a process. There's no process. You just got to make a decision that you're tired of being where you are and that you're willing to forgive. And that you're trusting God saying, God, I give this up to you. I don't want this anymore. This has been controlling my life for entirely too long. That person ain't even thought twice about you. And they're still controlling your life. And then we're wondering why we can't get to where God wants us to be. Forget the past. You got to forget the past. Turn to somebody and say, I don't want to be a slave no more. I don't want to be a slave to my past. Woo, oh, that one was a little weak. That one was a little weak. Let's try this again. I don't want to be a slave no more. I don't want to be a slave to my past. I want to be a slave to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you know what? When I stopped, when I stopped settling, for staying the same. See, because out of one, my, one side of my mouth, I was saying I want to change. Out of the other side of my mouth, I was saying, um, it's a process. It's a process. It's a process. See, and whichever one you speak to the most, is the one that's going to gain power. Yeah. So what I was doing is I was speaking to, I was speaking to as a process, and I was giving that power, negating the power that God has in forgiveness. And it was amazing. When I made the decision, it, wasn't, it didn't even have to be a process. It didn't have to be a process. Once I was real with myself and I was honest with myself that the reason I was doing it because I was trying to make somebody else pay and I was honest with myself, God, I don't want this anymore. It was like that. It was like that. It was like, oh, I could do this. It happened that fast. That prayer literally took me about 10 minutes. And I've been holding on to that for 46 years. 46 years in bondage. 46 years as a slave to it. 46 years. And in 10 minutes, God said, it's done. Your desire, this year the theme was total surrender. Your desire to change must be greater than your desire to stay the same. It has to be. 
And the last verse, and we're going to be gone. It says this. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. If you don't change who you travel with, if you don't stop complaining, and if you don't forget the past, you will lose your desire to change. That says, but now our appetites are gone. Too many of you have allowed who you travel with. Too many of you have allowed complaining. Too many of us have allowed the past to suck the life out of us. And we've lost our desire to change. We've lost our desire to change. And we just said, I'll just stay right here where I am. I'll just exist. Because that's what you're doing. You're just simply existing. God didn't call you to exist. He said, I came that you might have life and life in abundance. Not just to exist. God wants you to have life and life in abundance. Fathers, God wants you to have life and life in abundance. Mothers, Everybody in this place, God wants you to have life and life in abundance. So don't settle. You got a choice today. Will you change or will you stay the same? Father, this day we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our life. We thank you for your desire for us to change. Your word is truth, your word is powerful, and your word always brings about change. So this day, Father, I pray that our hearts are open to the change that you're trying to bring forth. Let us be part of the solution and not accept those things that are preventing us from changing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.